Hey folks, Shamia here with the Just Shamia Show with the lovely, super talented, award-winning, world-renowned, beautiful, <laughs> Nina, fabulous, Fabumi. <laughs> I'm getting there. <laughs> All right, we're at the Joyce Gordon Gallery in Oakland. So before we dive in, Nina, tell us, what are you reading and what are you listening to? What am I reading? Okay. Right now, I'm reading Americano by Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Have oh, you heard right. about it? Americano. Mm -mm. It's a it novel about the immigrant experience in the U.S. And that novel speaks to me because it's, it covers so many things that I've been through. And it's just like... I'm relating with her experience because it's kind of like my life in a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, Americana. Americana, yeah. We gotta check that out. Uh -huh. All right, what are you listening to? Oh my God, I am a hopeless romantic. Oh, okay. <laughs> I listen to Celine Dion all the time. Uh -huh. She is like my blood sister. All right. Yeah, she speaks to me. <laughs> What's your favorite Celine Dion song? Oh, tell him. All right. You, yeah. you sing with the tracks? Yeah, actually, that song, I sang it at a karaoke contest and I came to wow. it. I won like with this big dining furniture okay. <laughs> and some money. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, if you feel inspired, go ahead. One day. <laughs> She's like, not today. <laughs> I could. You want me to sing it? Sing. If you want to. What, what's part of the chorus? I'll sing the chorus. Okay. Tell him. Tell him that the sun and moon rise and he dies. Reach out to him and whisper tender words so soft and sweet. I'll hold him close to feel his heart beat. Love will be the gift you give yourself. You have a lovely voice. Thank you. Wow. Who knew? <laughs> Thank you for sharing that, Nina. So tell us a little bit about your background. Who is Nina? Where are you from? I'm from Nigeria. Uh -huh. I was born in Lagos. I lived in Nigeria all my life. I okay. only came to the U.S. in 2011 mm -hmm. to, to study arts at the Academy of Arts University. All right. So... I studied real estate at Obafemi Awolo University in Ife. Mm -hmm. I worked in a radio station called Kula FM. I worked in Access Bank, and then I spent eight years in Globalcom before I finally came here. So I've gone from broadcasting to banking to telecoms, and finally back to my first passion. Art is something I've done since I was six years old. Mm -hmm. my, my dad was an architect, and he was very protective of us, so a lot of times we would just be in the house. Like, mm -hmm. We never went out. We went to school and we came back home. We couldn't go out, mingle, socialize. The house was huge. Mm -hmm. Dad had a studio in the house and he always had pencils and crayons and art materials. So, and you know, we were six children and trying to get to watch TV was really hard. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and my older brother and older sister and everyone. You know, they would pick what programs to watch. Right, so, right. So yeah, I so I drew a lot. Okay. And, and my dad was very strict, and mm -hmm. it was, he was a disciplinarian. And a lot of times I was scared of him, and I would run from him. But mm -hmm. but when it came to art, like I would draw, and I say, Daddy, you look what I drew. And my dad would be very encouraging. And in his studio in the house, he had a wall yeah. where he pinned up everything I gave him. Like wow. my dad had a collection of all my works since I was six. So he, wow. he was very encouraging. Wow. Yeah, so my decision to take it up professionally happened when I got a little frustrated with the job I was at. Mm -hmm. So I worked in a telecoms firm which is called Globalcom and that was the second national carrier in mm -hmm. Nigeria. And Globalcom was a nice company, like it started off really well, somewhere I was really excited to work in. And I, I got hired as a call center representative, but after my training I got made a team leader. And I rose to supervisor and then to manager, but but from 2008 till 2011, my salary had been frozen. Wow. <laughs> so, and it wasn't just me. So, the company is very diverse. We have a lot of expatriates from other countries. Mm -hmm. And so, we 
we, I mean, some people got hired and they just felt like customer service was not bringing in any revenue. So mm -hmm. they felt like this, this is not an income generating department. So we're not going to raise the salaries, wow. which is really wrong because we take care of the customer. Right, right. We keep them here and they bring in the money. So it was just frozen. And uh, I was getting really frustrated. Like, how can I be going from supervisor to manager on the same salary? Hello. And... It, you know, it was annoying and every other person was going through the same. So I had to channel all that anger and annoyance into something else. And I'm an artist, I paint. So mm -hmm. I just started focusing a little more on my work and I started making more headway. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, we want to talk more about your, your journey and your story uh, as a painter and, a, and an artist. And she does a lot. She sings, she draws, <laughs> she paints. I'm sure there's more for us to find out. But first, I want to get your um, your opinion on a couple of news stories. Okay. Okay. So Senator Ernie Chainer, Chambers of Omaha, Nebraska is being criticized for comparing ISIS to police treatment of black Americans, um, especially in the wake of everything that's happened with Michael Brown and um, and just lots of Eric Garner, lots of different stories about police brutality here in the United States. And um, he said some comments, and I'm paraphrasing here, that ISIS isn't the immediate threat that he's seeing. The immediate threat are all these police forces who are being told to shoot first and ask questions later, who um, even within his own district there in Omaha, they've seen through investigations that there's some corruption there, but these same officers are still on the force. So there, he's um, garnering a lot of criticism for his, from his uh, fellow senators. And I'd also like to just state that Chambers is one of two black senators. So there's 49 total. He's one of the two black senators. So um, they just jumped on that and said, you know, there's no way ISIS are terrorists. You can't be calling police terrorists. We need our police. We love our police officers. What are your thoughts on his comments? And basically what he's saying is that, yes, while ISIS may be a threat to some people and they're terrorizing people over there, here's my immediate threat that I'm seeing that we're seeing as black Americans from the police force. Do you think he was wrong for that comparison? I don't think he was wrong. Mm -hmm. I think he was on point. Because sometimes they say the people who hurt you the most are the people who love you, mm -hmm. the people you love. So the police are meant to protect. Mm -hmm. And there's something supposed to be comforting about seeing police. Like there are certain parts of the Bay Area I walk around and it doesn't look like a very peaceful area, but if I see a police car there, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm like, okay, at least you're assured. Exactly, mm -hmm. I'm assured. So when the same people are the ones that are the threats or that are, you know, shooting and killing innocent young boys, mm -hmm. then that means that they wear another hat and they're supposed to protect, but they're not. Mm -hmm. So you don't see the danger coming, which is worse. Like ISIS. They're terrorists. We know they're terrorists. Mm -hmm. They're beheading people and killing people in the name of religion. And that is brutal and awful. Mm -hmm. But we know that that's who they are and that's what they're doing. And we right. know, like, don't go there because that's what's happening over there. But, but the police, they're to serve and to protect. And we like that we have police and we have law and we have enforcement. And we're supposed to feel safe. Mm -hmm. But if we don't feel safe with the people that are supposed to protect us, then that's that's worse. So people are calling for him to resign, at the very least apologize for his statements. Do you think he should apologize or resign? I think that he may, may need to choose his words and be a little more diplomatic about how he presents it. Mm -hmm. I think that there's a way you can get your message out there without being like, I mean, read in between the lines. Don't be so clear about it, but mm -hmm. still say it. So I don't think he needs to. I think that America is a free country and everybody has freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. He's not shooting or killing anyone or trying to offend anyone. He's just pointing out the obvious. And I mean, over the past couple of years, innocent people have died and mm -hmm. did not need to die. Like we have, we have a jail, lock somebody up if you find a problem with them. But when you kill, that's it. Right. They don't, they cannot wake up from the grave and defend themselves or even be heard. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's really bad. So I don't think he needs to resign. Mm -hmm. I'm a mother. I have two kids. Mm -hmm. I fear for my kids as well. I don't mm -hmm. want them to have to go through police brutality or anything. I want them to see a police officer and be happy that this is a police officer and I feel safe and we need to feel safe with the police. Let me ask you this question. As a mother with, with, with two beautiful boys, what do you tell your children, your sons, about 
engaging with police officers. If a, if a police officer comes to you and asks you a question or stops you, do you tell them how to behave? Well, you know, the thing, the luck we've had is, I mean, all the police officers that I've ever had any reason to have an encounter with have been really nice. Great. Like one time my painting got stolen uh -huh. so <laughs> in my apartment building. Wow. And I called the police and they came. Mm -hmm. And that's just the painting and it's just little me in this little apartment. And mm -hmm. they came and my kids saw them there. Right. And I said, you see, I'm telling them that these are officers and they're here to help us. Mm -hmm. And they came. I mean, eventually, whoever brought, stole the paint and brought it out because they had seen law enforcement in the building. So yes. just their presence in the building just made the culprit bring out the paint. Mm -hmm. So I tell them that the police are your friends. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they're human beings too. Mm -hmm. They make mistakes. So don't do anything to, to like trigger annoyance or anger and them just cooperate like sometimes I mean they get they hear the news mm -hmm. so they know like some some teenager got killed by police so I mean, mommy what happened and I have to explain to them that it was a misunderstanding or a miscommunication or maybe somebody was perceived wrongly and the police officer is human too so he wears a uniform but he can make a mistake so whatever we do we just need to try not to provoke them mm -hmm. because we're human too and we get angry and we get upset and sometimes we get trampled over but I of course the provocation is not an excuse for it's shooting never, and killing it, someone it, especially i think of a 12 year old boy in ohio who was killed it's never an excuse mm -hmm. i mean i watched a video on youtube where a man was choked to death yeah by by police officers and he was harmless. Yeah. He was handcuffed. Mm -hmm. I mean, what? He couldn't push a punch or even, not, he couldn't do anything. He was just handcuffed and getting choked and that was it. And I was like, really? Mm -hmm. So I really don't, like, sometimes it's confusing because who, who knows what happened? Right. The kid's been killed. How is he ever going to give his own account of the story? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I just think that, that statements like that, it's supposed to make law enforcement more aware of how they're being perceived by society mm -hmm. and that's supposed to make them change their image. They need to present themselves as people who are here to serve and protect. Good point for consideration. Okay, ballots are being counted um, as we speak after a highly contested, heated presidential election in Nigeria. Um, reminder to people or, or just informing those who don't know so, Nigeria is Africa's largest oil producer um, and has one of the largest economies in all of the continent of Africa. Some of the things that we've heard about Nigeria recently too is that it's kind of like home of Boko Haram who you know kidnapped those 200 plus schoolgirls who you know been doing lots of different things but there's lots happening in Nigeria about Nigeria this presidential election. So um, with the election just happening, wrapping up, and they're counting ballots and all of that, have you been seeing coverage by U.S. media, so living here in the States, about the election in Nigeria? I have. Okay. Yeah. And why do you think this election is so important? <laughs> <laughs> or do you think it's an important election? You know what, when it comes to Nigeria and politics, there's just so much. I don't know what angle to begin to comment on. Like, Nigeria is a rich country. Mm -hmm. We are blessed in abundance. We have oil, we have agriculture, we have, we have very intelligent people. Mm -hmm. we, have, we have so many resources and we have so much that it just breaks my heart to see how the country is being mismanaged. What I have an issue with in the elections is the transparency and the like the truthfulness of it. Mm -hmm. I've only ever voted once in my life. Mm -hmm. Like I've been eligible to vote for all these years and I've only done it once, but why? Why is that? I remember that day very well. I was in my father's house and that was the time when Obasanjo was being re-elected and that was the first time ever I voted and my mom had voted and she voted at Obasanjo and I was like, I'm not going to vote for him, I'm going to vote for somebody else. I don't remember who it was, I think mm -hmm. it was Yanifa where Emi was supposed to be like somebody who's really vocal and very more straightforward. 
And my mom laughed at me and she said, you know he's not going to win. Ambassador is going to win. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, mom, how do you know that? She said, see, he's already won even before. <laughs> even before people are voting, we already know who's going to win. So what's mm -hmm. the point of voting in somebody else? Because I already know who's going to win. And of course, he got re-elected. Mm -hmm. There is so much corruption in Nigeria mm -hmm. that I think voting is just like putting up appearances. So we, we want to see, oh, the people voted. Seemingly democratic, yeah. yeah. It's, like, it's like staging a show because we know that at the end of the day that they're still going to do what they're going to do. Mm -hmm. So what's the point? It's but like, in this particular case, I mean, and people have made this election about a lot of different things. They made it about military, mm -hmm. saying that one of the candidates is, you know, with his military background, mm -hmm. that he's really the secret leader of Boko Haram. You've heard all these rumors. I've heard people making it about religion where one candidate is Muslim, the other candidate is from, is Christian. Yeah. I've heard about being North and South, <laughs> one being from the North, one being from the South. Um, but it isn't so clear cut where it's like, who's the definitive winner here? Um, I, I, we've heard stories that there were lots of issues with um, people being able to cast their, their votes. So there's this new electronic um, balloting system and even the incumbent president wasn't able to cast his ballot because the machine wasn't working. So I don't know if that's, you know, actual problems or part of the corruption or what, but what have you heard about the predicted outcome of this election and who's going to win? Honestly, I don't know who's going to win. Mm -hmm. Like, I haven't heard any definitive prediction on who's going to win. Mm -hmm. Like, I heard, I don't keep numbers, but in some states, Definitely the Northerner is winning. Buhari Buhari has more votes in more states in the north. Mm -hmm. Good luck has more votes in more states in the south, which is expected. Right. But I think choosing between Buhari mm -hmm. and and Jonathan is like choosing between like I don't wanna it's it's like the devil and the deep blue sea. Mm -hmm. It's like the best of two evils. Mm -hmm. Which direction are you gonna go? Right. With Jonathan I'm a Southerner. I'm from the South South. Right. I would say he's from my catchment area. Mm -hmm. So I could say, oh, I want to cast my vote for Jonathan because he comes from where I'm from. But in all honesty, Jonathan's government mm -hmm. has seen the most number of, of Nigerians killed. And just to can, can clarify, so Jonathan Goodluck is the incumbent. He's the current president running yeah. for re-election. Okay. We've had a lot of security issues. Mm -hmm. We've had like... Boko Haram has thrived the most mm -hmm. in his government. We've had bomb explosions, people getting beheaded and kidnapped. Even the crisis that's happening like in the oil areas, mm -hmm. everything has been blown way, I mean, much more than it was before. Mm -hmm. And nothing has been done about it. So let me ask you this question because, yeah. so in, in America media, we see a lot of times where, um, the uh, Secretary of State and all these other different U.S. officials are going into these countries mm -hmm. and trying to mediate the peace yeah. um, on behalf of the residents there with what's happening with Boko Haram, with the number of killings and massacres and, and, and kidnappings. Why do you feel that America or some other interests, the United Nations, isn't coming in and taking a more active um, role in res restoring or creating peace in Nigeria? You know, I'm going to go back to the statement that says, God helps those who help themselves. Mm -hmm. Like, we as a nation, what have we done about it? Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I think that we probably need the help of America or whatever country wants to intercede because a lot of people have died for no reason. Mm -hmm. But what have we done about it? Like, if America is going to step in, they need cooperation. They need to know what steps have you taken to, to fix this. Mm -hmm. And one time, Good Luck was put on air on CNN or some other, either BBC or CNN. I watched it on YouTube. And he could not even comment on the security situation mm -hmm. in Nigeria. Like, his comment was pathetic. Mm -hmm. Oh, my God. I was, I was in shock. And I feel like... So, all this is happening and people are being butchered like massacred knives and beheaded and burned and just dehumanized mm -hmm. what have you done about it if you're not doing anything about it how do you expect somebody else to do something about it so let me ask you this question with 
I mean, it's a matter of, of time, either today or tomorrow, but very soon we're gonna know who the next president of Nigeria is going to be. Nigeria, again, the largest oil producer in all of Africa, and in addition to all of the other natural resources being exploited by all these Western nations um, from Nigeria. Regardless of who wins the election, what are you as a Nigerian citizen expecting from your president? your next president. Okay. Let's start with restoring peace mm -hmm. and making people feel safe. There was a time when, like places like Joss, mm -hmm. Joss is a beautiful place in the north. It was a tourist resort. It had the best views and, and you know, parks and recreational centers. And, and then all of a sudden we have this Joss, Joss crisis mm -hmm. with a lot of people dying. Like, there's just no peace. Mm -hmm. We just want peace. Let our nation be peaceful. Let people want to come to Nigeria and feel safe. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes when I go back to Nigeria and I come back to the U.S. and I have instructors or teachers or friends that are like, Oh my God, Nina, you're back. We were so worried about you. Because yeah. we saw Nigeria in the news and we just thought about you. And I said, well, Nigeria is a big nation, mm -hmm. and all these things are not happening everywhere. We do have some areas that are peaceful, like most of the most westernized cities like Lagos, you don't have these kind of things happening. But yeah, we're still a nation, and we're still perceived as a nation, and it's still happening. So people worry about me, mm -hmm. and then people who want to go to Nigeria are scared right. of going to Nigeria. We mm -hmm. don't want that. We want to be perceived better. Mm -hmm. We want peace. We want security. And then we want people to have a better standard of living. Mm -hmm. Like electricity, electricity, it, it doesn't. It's not constant, mm -hmm. and that's something that's so basic in the rural areas. Every, in every area, even in the cities, in okay, the city, everywhere. Mm -hmm. Like okay. watching TV, boom, it goes off, and mm -hmm. there's no, sometimes the transformer blows up, mm -hmm. and then the current comes back, and it's high current, and all your electrical appliances burn out. Boom, 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 yeah, <laughs> you burn out. So people are stressed out. Mm -hmm. You go to work, the roads are bad. People die on, on highways because of potholes. Mm -hmm. Like, we just want to have a peaceful nation somewhere we feel safe mm -hmm. and where we can have a good standard of living. Yeah. Well, I pray that that's to come and, you know, we'll certainly stay tuned and see what happens with the outcome of, of the election. Yeah. Um, it's going down in Fresno, folks. <laughs> Deputy Police Chief. Uh, Keith Foster was arrested on federal charges, including conspiracy to distribute oxycodone, heroin, and marijuana. He's facing potentially 45 years or more, over $2 million in fines, all of that. So this is after um, a year-long um, federal or FBI and ATF collaborative investigation with wiretaps and surveillance and all these different things. So he's arrested. Deputy Police Chief in Fresno. Suspiciously to me, the feds immediately recommended that he be released. Immediately, you know, pending the trial and all of that. And he's on paid administrative leave. So this is a man who is second in command of the entire Fresno police force, who has been charged by the FBI, ATF, after a year-long investigation, with all of these corruption charges and drug distribution, etc. But they recommend that he be released immediately, <laughs> and he's getting paid. Um, have, had you heard about this story? No. Um, to me, it's just very suspicious where the same people who are charging you are recommending that you be released, saying, oh, he's a pillar in the community, he's not a flight risk, he's a police officer. But there's also four, um, he has four uh, co-conspirators who remain behind bars. They're not police officers, they're just regular citizens and I, I didn't hear that they were, their release was recommended. To you, what do you think that, um, what's going on in Fresno? The other thing that's happened is that um, since this story, reporters have been going to the mayor's office, the city manager's office, asking for comments and they're being told, don't ask questions, don't dig, just let this go. Um, to me, with the response from the mayor's office, trying to shut it down and not cooperate with um, the, you know, someone in this very high position in the police force, you know, having this role in this massive drug ring, there seems to be some level of corruption there. So I guess one of my first questions to you is, if he was a lay citizen, you or I or anybody else, 
not this police officer, second in command, do you think that we would be sitting behind bars waiting our trial? Or do you think we get to go home and keep collecting a check from our job? We're definitely <laughs> not going home. Right. I think that regardless of whether I know a lot about the story, if you're convicted or you have all these charges Charge. uh -huh. against you, yeah. then, then there's no justice in you being released mm -hmm. without everything being ironed out and you being made to pay for those things they've done. Mm -hmm. So it's wrong. It's definitely wrong. And I feel like definitely, I mean, because of who he is and the position he holds and he probably knows a lot of people who are, yeah. so he's being favored mm -hmm. and that is not justice. Right. Especially as you see that there's again four of co-conspirators with him in this particular case. They're still incarcerated while he's free and he's still being paid by the police force. So you think that that's fair that while he's facing these very serious charges where, you know, he abused his role as second in command of this police force, which is a very big city in, in our Central Valley here in California and uh, abusing that role and, you know, being uh, doing all of these activities. He's still being paid. <laughs> He's think, still collecting a check. Is that something that we don't know? Like, was he set up? Because I don't see any other reason why he should be going scot free. And well, from the evidence that that we've seen, no, he was obtaining prescriptions of oxycodone. He was seen. They have surveillance of him going to a CVS, picking up a hundred pills, making a drop to. I don't know if the person he was making the drop to was a federal informant. They they have him on tape doing this a few times. So no, I don't think that he was set up. Clearly, and this was a year long investigation yeah. with multiple federal agencies, the ATF, the yeah. FBI, yeah. investigating this man and these four other individuals who were in charge of this ring: heroin, yeah. oxycodone, marijuana. You know, it's, it's very serious, but he's uh, released at the recommendation of the federal authorities and still collecting a check. That's wrong. Mm -hmm. It's just wrong. He needs to be brought to book first. Yeah. Yeah. As I think about just the numbers of particularly black men in this country who are, who are imprisoned. Yeah, well, who are killed for nothing, who are imprisoned at grossly disproportionate numbers. And then you have, you know, this person who's a police chief. Um, or deputy chief, second in command, who does this and, you know, yeah. gets to go home and sit on the couch and collect the check while they figure out the details about the court case. I think the justice system should serve everyone equally. Mm -hmm. Like there are young black boys who got killed and never even got to tell their stories. Right. And this is just so wrong, especially mm -hmm. with what's already been going on in that, that area. Yeah. It's wrong. So people, we need to talk about it. Send a message.